So at this time, I'd like to ask Debbie Saddington to come forward and introduce our first speaker. Debbie uh, is uh, a 2013 graduate of Southwestern University, and she's currently a first-year medical student at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School. Debbie. Good morning. Modern medicine is advancing so quickly that our physicians are finding less time to learn the valuable lessons from the past. And with concerns of healthcare costs, efficiency, and access plaguing our nation, doctors are finding less time to spend with their patients. Today, we are fortunate to have with us a physician who has taken the time to look back into history, to examine pre-modern medicine, and the timeless aspects of the doctor-patient relationship that may prove successful if re-emphasized in patient care today. Dr. Victoria Sweet is currently an Associate Clinical Professor of Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and she is a prize-winning historian. Before coming to UCSF, Dr. Sweet practiced medicine for 20 years at Laguna Honda Hospital in San Francisco while simultaneously earning her PhD in medical history. Being at the very beginning baby steps of my own healthcare career, I am all ears when I hear the phrases right diagnosis and proper treatment. Dr. Sweet's experiences at Laguna Honda helped reveal a lot about how time, hospitality, compassion, and community are fundamental in arriving at the right diagnosis and the proper treatment. In her recent book, God's Hotel, Dr. Sweet uses patient stories from her time at Laguna Honda and the history of medicine as a way to address how physicians and other healthcare professionals can reduce the tension of providing both efficient and satisfying medical care. Her suggestion of combining slow medicine with modern medicine allows the doctor to have enough time to do a good job and to evaluate each patient in a holistic manner. Dr. Sweet points out that the Latin word curare can be translated as both cure and care. If our healthcare system focuses more on providing curare, as pre-modern medicine did, we just might find that spending more time with patients is actually more efficient and cost-effective. Dr. Sweet has several projects, including the Second Opinion Clinic and the Eco Medicine Project, that focus on implementing a new approach towards long-term patient care, while comparing its effectiveness to the current practices of modern medicine. Today, we have a visionary in our midst. By tying together her interests in history and medicine, Dr. Sweet has suggestions for reestablishing the personal in medicine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Victoria Sweet. Well, thank you very much for having me here. I'm really excited about being here, not just to get a chance to speak to you about what I've been doing, but also to learn, because Dr. Pierce has put together an incredible group of people that I think may help us actually start solving this fundamental problem, which I'm calling the, the, the sort of split between, let's call it slow medicine and fast medicine. And what I thought I would do today is start by telling you a little bit about myself, then about this unusual hospital where I practiced medicine for 20 years, um, and a little bit, if I can fit it in, about the pilgrimage I ended up taking across uh, France and Spain, which really changed uh, how I looked at patients to a great extent, and end with some reflections on how we might put fast medicine and slow medicine together. It talks about mm, 45 minutes or so, depending on how fast I talk. Uh, maybe 48, maybe 42. But that'll um, allow time for questions and comments, which are always really helpful to me going forward. It's one of the things I get out of speaking is, 
finding out, I, I learn things and I'm provoked. So please feel free um, at the end of the talk to stand up and say your piece. So first of all, you, what you should know about me is I don't consider myself a natural born doctor. You know, when I was growing up, there were always kids in the class who were like, they watched all the television programs and they volunteered in hospitals and they wanted to see any owie you had. That was not me. I didn't want to have anything to do with bodies or sickness or, or abscesses or boils or wounds. And in fact, when I told my family I was going to medical school, they were absolutely surprised. What had happened to me was that at the end of college, and by the way, I uh, majored in mathematics, <laughs> but I minored in classics. Welcome. Um, and at the end of, and I didn't know what to do, and, and I've heard from a lot of students, right? I was torn between science and humanity, and I stumbled on Carl Jung's memoirs, the psychiatrist Carl Jung, his memoirs, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections. And when I read that book, really my life was changed. As I was reading this book, going like, wow, this is what I want to do when I grow up. I love the fact that he put the sciences and humanities together. I love the way he set up his life also. You know, living by the Lake of Zurich and seeing well-paying, articulate patients in the morning and illuminating manuscripts and studying alchemy in the afternoon. I decided that's what I wanted to be when I grew up, and that's why I got to medical school. I was going to be a Jungian analyst. But then it turned out I liked medical school a lot more than I thought I would, especially the last two clinical years, which is when you finally start getting to see patients. And I especially was taken by what we call the workup, which is the way, the approach to a patient who walks into your office. And it consists of the history, where you talk with patients and you listen to patients. And what I liked about that so much was that there was a lot of psychology to it, right? How I asked a question, how the patient answered, what they said, what they didn't say, how they looked. And then there, that's the first part of the workup. Then the second part is the physical exam where we examine the patients. And I really loved that because it turns out that there are thousands of signs that are written on the body uh, by your disease. And if you're really good at physical diagnosis, you can make a lot of diagnoses just from examining a patient. And I was quite taken with that. And then there was putting it all together to come up with what we call the differential diagnosis, which is all the different possibilities a disease, uh, a, a group of symptoms could, could be from. And then the sort of plan you have about how you're going to determine what it is by taking out what it isn't. So it's a very logical, methodical, and brilliant uh, process. Nevertheless, I continued my original plan, and I started my psychiatry residency. So I finished my medical school four years, and I started my psychiatry residency. But it turns out I ended up without, I was a little naive, and I started my psychiatry residency on the only locked ward, psychiatric ward, in the county. And so my patients were not Jung's well-paying, articulate, <laughs> neurotic patients. They were severely psychotic. And what I found, to my surprise really, was that the antipsychotic medications that we gave them worked much better than the talk therapy I tried. So after I finished that year, I got my medical license and I decided I was just going to go out and practice medicine and see what happened. And I practiced medicine that way for several years, mostly in community clinics and county clinics. That is, if anybody's planning on going to medical school or in medical school, that's a wonderful way to get experience with all kinds of people and diseases. The county clinics I was in, every time there was a war or a rumor of war, we'd get a wave of immigrants coming in and they'd come with their unusual diseases. I ended up seeing three cases of leprosy for instance, and this was two miles from Stanford University. I ended up seeing all the parasites there were and very many unusual diseases, unusual cancers. But even more, I got to hear from these patients, sort of had, had to understand that they had a different way of looking at the body than mine. Sometimes it's hard for me to intuit what it was, right? I have this very you know, cellular model of the body. 
And the more I practiced medicine, the more impressed I was by modern medicine, by its logical, methodical way of arriving at a diagnosis. Really, it's quite brilliant. But I was also more and more impressed by what it left out of the patient's issues. And that was really anything that didn't fit, naturally, its logical method. So after several years, I started looking into alternative medicines. I looked into naturopathy and homeopathy and Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine. And I found Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine really fascinating because it was a completely different model of the body. And I thought for quite a while, and perhaps I should learn, learn it, but I thought that, figured that that would mean learning Chinese or learning Sanskrit. And I finally decided even if I did learn Chinese, even if I did learn Sanskrit, these systems were so different from mine that I would never really understand them. It was at this uh, really discouraging moment that I discovered a book in the library. It jumped out at me from the HQ section, as I recall, which was a fascinating uh, book called Hildegard of Bingen's Medicine. Turned out, that Hildegard of Bingen was a 12th century nun. She was also a mystic and a visionary and a musician. And as it turned out, she was a medical practitioner. And she'd written a book about her 12th century medicine. And it had just been translated from the Latin in which she wrote it into German and into English. And as I was sitting there in the library reading this, I was I was floored because it was not the eye of new tongue of frog medicine I expected from a medieval medical text. It was a, it was a real medicine for real patients with real uh, diseases that I could recognize, but it was based on a completely different model of the body than my own model. And I, I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but it was much more like the Chinese model or the Ayurvedic model. And I decided at that moment that I was going to go back to school and I was going to get a PhD uh, in history with Hildegard of Bingen as my focus. And that's how I got to this very unusual hospital, Laguna Honda Hospital in San Francisco, because it was the only place that would let me practice medicine part time. So I didn't want to stop practicing medicine. But I, I wanted to get a PhD, and I knew it was going to take a lot of work. And I actually spent, at the time, about two months looking for a place that would let me practice medicine. And Laguna Honda was the only place that would do that. And when I went over uh, to, uh, for my interview and saw the hospital for the first time, I was completely surprised, because it didn't look like a hospital. It looked like a medieval monastery. It uh, was high on a hill overlooking the ocean. And it had, uh, it was had cream colored walls and a red tiled roof and uh, turrets and a bell tower. And uh, I went for my interview and then the medical director took me around. The place was huge. It was on 62 acres of land right in the middle of San Francisco. And it had 1,178 patients. And so as we walked around, uh, the medical director showed me these, where the patients were on, which are these long, open, used to be called nightingale wards of 30 beds with the solarium at the end and the windows and the beds along the walls. So I saw those. And then she showed me, uh, we went upstairs, and she showed me the x-ray department, where we had an x-ray machine, and I could take my own x-rays. She showed me the surgery suite, which looked like something out of an old 1930s movie, you know, with that big old steel thingamajig that they had over the bed and natural light, because all of this whole thing was made in the, had been built in the 20s. Then we walked past uh, the 1950s era beauty salon with its steel helmet hair dryers and the windows and the pink and all that. And then she, we went in and she showed me the chapel. The place had a chapel, even though it was run by the city, and it looked like a small church. It had polished wooden pews and stained glass windows and a very politically incorrect Stations of the Cross along the walls. Then we went back and we went outside and she showed me the grounds. There were gardens and there was a greenhouse so that patients could pot plants. 
there was an aviary that somewhat, it was clearly a hand-built aviary with pieces of glass and wood, it was huge, filled with birds, so that uh, patients could watch chickens hatch from eggs in little incubators. And then she, there was a little farmyard with a black pigs and uh, chickens and um, rabbits, so that patients could actually see animals, even if they were bed-bound. Then we walked back to her office, and she offered me this job. Well, I didn't know. I really wasn't sure. Laguna Honda was like no hospital I had ever seen or even imagined. But it was the only place that would offer me a part-time job so I could go back to school. So I told her I would come. I hedged my bets. I told her I would come for two weeks, uh, two months. And I ended up staying for more than 20 years. Because <laughs> it turned out that it was a fascinating place to practice medicine. And the reason for that is that originally Laguna Honda was called an almshouse. Uh, some of you will know what that is, but probably not too many. So an almshouse from the word alms, and the almshouse was how we used to take care of the sick poor before there was health insurance. This is the original Laguna Honda. It wasn't called Laguna Honda, but it was in the same place. This was built in the 1860s. And the word almshouse was how we used to take care of the sick poor. The way the system worked is there would be, every county was responsible for the care of their sick poor financially. So every county would have a big old county hospital that was basically open to everyone that was free. It was funky. It wasn't, it wasn't equal to the care of the rich, but it was there and you could walk in, you could get taken care of if you were acutely ill. And then if you needed more care or were chronically ill, or if you were an orphan, or if you were mentally ill, or if you were an unmarried pregnant woman, if you were anybody they didn't know what to do with, they sent you to the almshouse, which traditionally was on the outskirts of the city and was also free. Then what happened, and every county used to have this kind of system, then what happened in the 1950s is most of the almshouses in the country were closed for reasons of justice from the left and economy from the right. And it turns out Laguna Honda was probably the last almshouse in the country. It's how I got the name from my book, actually, uh, because in French, the same institution is called a Hotel Dieu, so God's Hotel. And that's how I got the name for the book. And so what happens in an almshouse is you end up getting the bottom one-tenth of one percent of everybody in your city, whoever that is, right? People just can't manage. And so it turned out that the patients at Laguna Honda were fascinating. They're fascinating people, because I had people from everywhere, all over the world, all kinds of situations. And they had very interesting diseases, because it was sort of a catchment for the whole city. So if a disease happened one in 100,000 times, I'd see three cases of it. It was fascinating medically. And the patients turned out to be really remarkable people. You know, I, I think of them as they were sort of two standard deviations from the mean. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. I won't even continue, right? <laughs> really, they were. They were the fattest and the thinnest and the tallest and the shortest and, and the most obnoxious and the nicest patients I ever had. And they had almost every disease, so I ended up seeing just about everything in my Harrison's textbook of internal medicine. And I learned a lot there. And, and as I started thinking about speaking, I asked myself, you know, if I had to put what I learned into one word, what would that word be? And I decided it would be, uh, this is the Hotel Dieu in Paris, to give you a sense in Paris, it's still called a Hotel Dieu, it's still called a God's Hotel. And anybody in Paris, you should make sure to walk in to the Hotel Dieu because it's still open. It's right next to Notre Dame, and you can just walk in and take a look. It's fascinating. So I decided that if I had to put what I learned into one word, it would be that medicine is personal. And this is a very ambiguous sentence, right? Medicine, what do, I, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, what I mean is that medicine works. Medicine is person to person and face to face. It doesn't work otherwise. But even more than that, it's that it needs to be taken personally. That's what I learned at Laguna Honda. It was a personal thing. I had to take my patients' problems personally as, as my problem. And who taught me this um, was one of my friends, uh, Dr. Curtis. That was really when I realized this. Because one of the things I realized is that if medicine isn't personal, it doesn't work. And I think that's partly what Dr. Pierce was referring to. 
We've got this whole wonderful system with all of this marvelous scientific technology, and yet there's a way in which we are all a little unnerved by the system right now. And I think partly it's because if medicine is personal, it works, and if medicine isn't personal, fundamentally it doesn't work. And what do I mean by works? I have a definition of my own. It's that medicine works when a patient is happy, when the doctor is happy, when we have the right diagnosis, and the right treatment, and all for the least amount of money. I think that would be a fair thing of working. And when this really struck me was when I ran into my friend, Dr. Curtis. He was coming back in from the hospital, and we ran in, in this great big hall, ran into each other in this great big hall we had in the middle of the hospital. <clears throat> and I could see he was in a hurry, but I was curious, so I asked him wh where he was going. And he told me he was going back to his ward to see a patient who'd been there for months and ready for discharge. But every time that uh, Dr. Curtis showed up on the ward to do his rounds, there this patient still was, still zipping around in his wheelchair, still going to therapy. So Dr. Curtis told me, finally I asked the guy why he was still there when, he could st when now he could walk. The guy told him, no shoes, Doc. I need special shoes, and they've ordered them for Medicaid, and they're waiting for Medicaid to approve them. So Dr. Curtis asked him, well, how long have they been waiting? Three months. Well, Dr. Curtis thought about that. He said, well, what size shoe do you wear? N size nine. So Dr. Curtis told me he thought about that. He thought about all the charts he had to write and all the forms he had to fill out. And then he just got in his car. And he drove over to Walmart, and he bought a pair of size 9 running shoes for $16.99. And now he was going back to the ward to put them on the patient and write the discharge orders. Was he going to submit his receipt for reimbursement? I asked him. And he just laughed. As I watched him rush off, I realized he reminded me of an aphorism that I'd always loved but had never understood. And it is that the secret in the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. Now, I'd always thought that that meant caring about a patient, you know, loving the patient, or at least liking the patient. But when I saw Dr. Curtis rush off to put shoes on a patient he barely knew, I thought there must be more to it than that. So I looked it up, and I found it in a talk by Dr. Francis Peabody to the medical school uh, of Harvard University were graduating in 1927. And it turned out when I read this piece that uh, Dr. Peabody referred to not to caring for a patient, not to caring about a patient, but caring for a patient, which he explained meant doing the little things that nurses usually do for the patient. So tucking in bedclothes or giving a patient sips of water. He admitted, he, say, he said in, his, in, in this article that it probably wasn't the most efficient way for a doctor to spend his time, but doing those personal things is what created the personal relationship between the doctor and the patient. And that relationship is the secret of healing. So what Dr. Peabody really was saying was that the secret in the care of the patient is inefficiency. That was pretty ironic because by this time, Laguna Honda had invited uh, a healthcare economics efficiency group into the hospital. And they were walking all around the hospital and they were finding inefficiencies. And I know that if they had found out about Dr. Curtis and those shoes, they would have thought it very inefficient, very wasteful of the time of a highly paid physician. But when you think about it, Dr. Curtis was really providing the most efficient healthcare of all. He got the right diagnosis, no shoes. He got the right treatment, shoes. And all for the least amount of money. And I, I call this to myself the efficiency of inefficiency. And it's what happens when medicine is personal. So <clears throat> in the meantime, of course, I had gone back uh, and started my PhD in Hildegard of Mingen's medicine. And uh, I decided that I wanted to understand her medicine 
uh, in the way that I couldn't understand Chinese medicine and uh, Sanskrit uh, and Ayurvedic medicine, and that is from the inside out. So I wanted to uh, understand Hildegard's medicine the way she understood it, or at least the way her student would have understood it. And that meant learning her languages, which was medieval Latin and medieval German, so I could, and being able to read her stuff in the original manuscripts that she'd written, so I learned paleography, which is the study of medieval handwriting, and codicology, which is the study of how they put books together so you could date a book. Um, I also read everybody who was contemporary with her so I could get a sense of her context, right, of what everybody else was doing. And I also experimented. So I actually grew some of her medicinal plants in my garden and I um, boiled up some of her potions and syrups. She had a lot of uh, recipes for medicinal ales, so I uh, learned to brew them up. And I even baked some of her antidepressant cookies. <laughs> and gradually, I began to get a sense of how her medicine was different from our mechanical model. So we actually have a, a very helpful mechanical model of the body, where the doctor is like a mechanic, the body's like a machine, something broken, the doctor looks for what's broken and fixes it or replaces it. This is a poster from 1923 by a wonderful artist um, uh, doctor named Fritz Kahn. And it, even though it was 1920s and their machines were a little bit different, you get the idea, right? We have the idea that the brain's a computer and the um, lungs are bellows and the heart's a pump and the kidneys are a filtering device and that the doctor's a mechanic. But Hildegard's model, I gradually realized, was very different. Her model was much more that a body was like a plant. And the doctor was more like a gardener than a mechanic. Well, what is the difference between body as machine and body as plant? The difference is, there's a fundamental difference, that someone has to fix a broken machine. But a plant can heal itself. Hildegard called the power of a plant to heal itself its viriditas. It's from the Latin, so it's greening power. From the Latin viridis, that means green, so it's where Spanish gets verde and French gets ver. And she thought that human beings had their own viriditas, their own healing power. And that the job of the doctor, like the job of the gardener, was to remove whatever is in the way of that viriditas, that healing power, and then to fortify it, to strengthen the natural healing power by manipulating the environment. It sounds kind of straightforward at this point, but really, I didn't really understand what, what she really meant until my patient, uh, who I call Terry Becker in the book. Hold on, sorry about that. So Terry was homeless. She was one of our homeless patients, and she lived on the streets with her boyfriend, Mike. And they smoked, and they drank, and they took drugs, and begged on the streets. And one day, Terry woke up, and she was paralyzed from the neck down. So she and Mike went over to the county hospital, and she was admitted, and they did the wonderful uh, used the wonderful method of modern medicine, they found out that Terry had a disease called transverse myelitis, which is a viral disease which causes your spinal cord to swell. And since the spinal cord is a bit like a wiring system, if we want to use a mechanical analogy, it stopped all the uh, wiring distal to where it had swollen, which is her neck, and so she couldn't move. It's a viral disease, so there was no treatment for it. But usually, transverse myelitis gets better with time. So, they, since Laguna Honda was still existed, they sent her over to the almshouse for rest and recuperation, and she was my patient. And she did get better for those first few weeks. She began to be able to move a little bit of her shoulder, a little bit of her fingers. Then the first of the month rolled around, which in San Francisco is when the homeless get their welfare cash from City Hall. All you have to do is show up, and they give you $360. So 
So Mike, her boyfriend, showed up, told me he was going to just take her out, go over to City Hall and get her welfare money. And they rolled out, and they didn't come back. And I didn't see Terry for about a year. But later, I found out during that year, she'd been seen in the emergency room 28 times. That one time, Mike had actually taken a two by four to her and fractured her skull and broken her leg robbed her and abandoned her on the streets in winter, and that she had developed a bed sore from sitting all day long in her wheelchair on the streets of San Francisco. And she'd been admitted three times to the county hospital to try and cover the open wound on her backside with skin, right, a graft, a skin graft. And every time she'd have these long, complicated, and expensive operations, the first of the month would roll around, Mike would show up, out they would go, and the skin graft would deteriorate and fail. Three times. Finally, that uh, bed sore became too big to treat. And the surgeons took a look at it and said, we can't do anything for this. So they sent her back to Laguna Honda, and I was her doctor again. And I have to tell you that when I saw that bed sore for the first time, I was absolutely shocked. I'd never seen anything like it before. It went from the middle of her back all the way down to her coccyx. It spanned both of her sit bones. And it was so deep that at the bottom of it, there was all that, you know, there was all that junk from all of her failed skin grafts, and you can just sort of imagine. At the very bottom, I could see Terry's spine. That's how deep it was. It was, it was horrifying. And I remember looking at that, thinking to myself, what are we going to do? There's, it really is too big to graph. And it's going to take a long time to heal on its own. And in the meantime, what was going to possibly stop Terry from getting an overwhelming infection? That kind of open, right? Everything's open. Uh, an overwhelming infection that would kill her. And giving her antibiotics wouldn't work because her, any germs she had would just get resistant to whatever I gave her. So I walked back to my little office on the ward, and I sat, found myself sitting, staring into this plant that a patient had given me many years before, who potted it in the greenhouse. By this time, it had grown all over the wall. And I found myself thinking, you know, this is amazing. I mean, somebody's going to die in the 20, at that time it was the 20th century, the 20th century, of a medieval disease. And then I asked myself, you know, it didn't seem like there was anything I could do about it. And then I, I just found myself asking, well, well, what would Hildegard do? What, how would she have looked at this open wound? What would she have done? I thought about the idea that coursing through Terry's body was this natural power of healing, this veriditas. And I thought, well, maybe Hildegard wouldn't do anything at all. Maybe she would just remove whatever was in the way of veriditas. I asked myself, well, what was in the way? Well, all the junk in that wound was in the way. All that stuff had to be taken out, had to be debrided, cleaned out completely. Anything that caught Terry's attention, like, you know, rumpled bedclothes or an uncomfortable mattress should be changed. Any medication she didn't absolutely need, I should discontinue. Just clearing, the, clearing things out. Uh, any emotional stuff she had, if I could, uncertainty. Was she going to be kicked out of the hospital? or? depression or sadness or anxiety. I should do my best to, to get that out of the way. And then I thought what Hildegard would do would be to fortify Veriditas, strengthen it with the basics. So with good food and fresh air and sleep and rest and sunlight. So that's what I did. Did all that, wrote the orders. And it was amazing to see how fast Hildegard's prescription began to work. I mean, in a few weeks, I could start to see this sort of glistening at the base of her wound. But then the first of the month rolled around, really. And Mike showed up. And he was still pretty cute. He was still walking, you know, he had a little tight Levi's, and he was still walking with his little strut. And Terry was at the very end of our long wards. The nurses 
really didn't like much, Mike very much. They made him wait in the waiting room. And we all stood there and watched Terry on her prone gurney, right, to keep the weight off her bed sore, wheel herself all the way down and go in to the waiting room to see Mike. The door closed, and we all sat there for quite a while waiting. Finally, Mike, door opened, Mike came out, and he left. Terry had thrown him out. She told him never to come back. And then she stopped smoking. So her appetite came back, and she started to eat. And that bed sore began to heal. It was really amazing watching it. it was actually, when I, watching it was when I decided that I needed to write a book about this. It was just magical. It was, I, saw the, I saw it about once a week, so I got it in sections, right? So its healing seemed almost as magical as those time-lapse photos I used to, they used to show us when I was in school where the, the plant goes from a seed in a few minutes. That's the way Terry's bed sore seemed to heal, you know? There was first that glistening, and then there was muscle appearing, and then subcutaneous tissue, and then all the whole time the skin was sort of crawling in from the sides so that the bed source looked shallower and shallower and narrower and narrower, smaller and smaller, until finally it just looked like a great big scab on top of Terry's back, huge scab. And then the scab started to flake off. And underneath was perfect Terry Becker skin underneath. It took a long time. It took two and a half years. But we were in no hurry, and neither was she. And during those two years, the social worker found her family, who lived in the Midwest, and wanted Terry to come live with them. And so at the end of the two and a half years, we had a patient gift fund for the patients. We bought her a ticket, and we flew her back uh, into the Midwest, and she lived with her family for many years, and did not go on the streets and uh, apparently did very well. It was watching Terry's bed sore heal that really changed the way I practice medicine. After Terry, I began to not just look at my patients with the eye of a modern doctor, asking myself, how can I fix this? But I would also look at my patient from the point of view of Hildegard and ask myself, what's in the way of veriditas? And what can I do to strengthen it? And what I found was that both ways look, work quite well when used on the right patient at the right time. What I found was that Hildegard's way works best on people with slow diseases. So chronic diseases, diseases that take a while to develop, or diseases for which we have no treatment. And I began to think of her way as a kind of slow medicine as opposed to the fast medicine we also use, which works so well. If you have an appendicitis, or get hit by a car, or have a heart attack, or even if you have cancer, but doesn't work very well after the appendectomy, after the surgeries, and after the chemotherapy. And although it's easy to put these two ways into, into opposition like I've just done, Right? Slow medicine, fast medicine. Actually, they work best together. And I think of them often as two perspectives. Same way our eyes give us two perspectives. And then putting those two perspectives together, you get a three-dimensional view. And so it's easy, though, to talk about how uh, that we should do this. But how do I do this in practice? How do I use fast medicine and slow medicine together with a real patient? So what I thought I would do is walk you through what I'd do at Laguna Honda when I'd get a new patient. So what would happen, the ambulance would bring them in with all their stuff and their records and deposit them in their new bed. But I wouldn't first go over the records. I wanted to see the patient for myself. So I would usually just walk over, down the long ward to the patient's bed, and sit down on a chair, or sit down on their bed, and from there, I would use the brilliant method I'd learned in medical school. I would take a history, and then I would do a thorough and complete physical examination, which takes about an hour. 
And I thought of it as my medical student exam, because it was so thorough. And then I would track down all the labs and x-rays and reports, call up the previous docs, and finally, when I had everything, I would sit down and look at everything. And I would first ask myself, is it urgent? If it wasn't urgent, I'd then ask myself, what are the diagnoses? Do I need to do any more tests? What kind of treatment do I need to order? Which is to say that I would lead with fast medicine, with the model of body as machine and doctor as mechanic, asking myself what's wrong and how can I fix it. But at the same time, while I was being the mechanic and doing what I'm calling here fast medicine, somewhere in the back of my mind, I was also doing slow medicine. I was being a gardener and seeing the body as a plant and to asking myself, well, how's this patient doing as a whole? Is he thriving or depleting? Flourishing or drying up? I was watching and feeling and estimating the patient's life force, his veriditas. It's a particular sense, and when I teach my medical students, I tell them it's our own personal lifometer, which automatically gets a sense, if we pay attention to it, about how much life a patient has, how much life you have to work with. And then I'd ask myself, what's interfering with this patient's life force, his veriditas? What's in the way of him thriving? To find out, I would put the patient back in the context of his environment. I would think about what he was eating and drinking, what he was taking in, what he was affected by, literally and figuratively. Hildegard and pre-medicine had a name for this. They called it regime. It was everything that happened around a patient that you could do something about, what you could manipulate or change. And they had a saying about it. It was this, three doctors you always have to hand, Dr. Diet, Dr. Quiet, and Dr. Merry Man. The Dr. Diet was everything you ate and drank and didn't eat. So food and drink and fasting. Dr. Quiet was quiet and sleep and rest, but it was also exercise and activity and sex. And Dr. Merryman was attitude, temperament, and emotion. And that's what I would fuss with from the slow medicine point of view. On the one hand, were there medications I could discontinue, pain, I could treat, discomfort I could assuage, anxiety I could allay. What could I do to remove those things, or at least palliate them? And on the other hand, what could I do to fortify my patient's veriditas? Change his diet, get him a beer or a cup of tea, new clothes, company, a computer, because the thing about Laguna Honda was, we had all those things, if you knew where to look for them. We had lots of kind hearts we could who could find a computer, or new clothes, or a bottle of beer, or a cup of tea, who would supply comfort, interest, and care. Even more wonderfully, we had time. I wasn't in a hurry, so I could thoroughly examine my patient and reach my own conclusions, order my tests and treatments, and see how well they went. I could see my patient every day, more than once a day, if I needed to. And you know, things would show up. Things would get clear. Family members or family disasters, missing pieces of the puzzle. Not only did I have enough time, my patient had enough time. He was not rushed. So it was fast medicine and slow medicine working together at many different levels. At the level of actual time, but even more at the level of style. Body as machine and body as plant. Mechanic and gardener. Focused and diffuse. The parts and the whole. 
It wasn't difficult at Laguna Honda to put fast medicine and slow medicine together. Well, by this time, I had changed, I'd finished my PhD, and as a present to myself for finishing, I decided to walk the medieval pilgrimage from France over the Pyrenees to Santiago de Compostela in Spain. Why did I want to do that? Well, what's a pilgrimage? A pilgrimage is a journey for spiritual reasons, but with a physical goal, a mountain or a church. And in the Middle Ages, being a pilgrim was a big deal. It was what we all are, the medieval people thought, pilgrims on the pilgrimage of life, leaving our true home at birth, traveling through a strange land called life to reach our spiritual goal at when we die. And there were three important pilgrimages in the Middle Ages, big ones. There was the pilgrimage where you walked to Jerusalem. There was a pilgrimage where you walked to Rome. And there was the pilgrimage where you walked to Santiago in Spain. And Santiago in the, for the Middle Ages was actually the newest pilgrimage. It had started because the body of St. James the Apostle to Spain had been miraculously discovered at the end of the ninth century in a stone boat at the uh, end of Spain. And a cathedral was built to, this is the, 19th, the eight, uh, Baroque version of the cathedral, was built to hold the uh, body of St. James. And people started to walk across France and Spain, and in fact, all of Europe, to make a pilgrimage to uh, Santiago and see the St. James. And what had happened is by Hildegard's time, the pilgrimage route became very, very popular. There were hundreds of thousands of people in Hildegard's time walking across Europe to Santiago. But then with the Renaissance, etc., it fell into disuse. And it really was only revived in the 1980s. And when I found that I could walk across Europe uh, in a medieval way, I decided to do it. I went with a friend from medical school. We decided to do the walk, which is 1,200 miles, in four different uh, sections, in four different yearly trips of 300 miles each. We went back every year for four years in early September, which is a beautiful time in France and Spain. And every year we went back to exactly where we'd started, and we put on our same clothes, and we took the next step. When I'd hear the click of my walking stick on the cobblestones, I would find that I would go right back into the space I'd left the year before, as if no time at all had passed. Every year when I went back to Laguna Honda with this experience, I found that my attitude, my whole feeling about everything was somewhat different. And I'd like to do today toward, toward uh, is just spend two minutes reading you what I took back from the first year, uh, from my book, uh, from the first year of the pilgrimage. After we left the cathedral in Le Puy in France, and we're walking through the south of France, direction Conque. There were many stunning moments on that first pilgrimage. It takes about two minutes, by the way. There were many stunning moments on that first pilgrimage. But the one I carried back to the hospital was the day it was pouring rain. We were a long way from the evening shelter and would be walking in the rain for a long time. It was very cold. I was soaking wet, and Rosalind, my companion, and I were singing to keep warm. There was mud, fields, rain, and I was chilled to the bone. Yet I didn't want to be anywhere else than in that muddy field or doing anything else than walking in the rain, or be anywhere else but anything else but chilled. I didn't want to have arrived at our warm and comfortable destination. I didn't want the rain to stop or the fields to stop being muddy. I didn't want to be dry or warm or to be one step further along or one step farther back. I wanted to be just where I was because only by being where I was could I experience what I was experiencing, which was pilgriming. As I walked through the field, I thought about how much of my life I had spent trying to make sure I would never be in that place, out in the cold, 
homeless and without shelter. I thought about my patients who lived on stoops, slept in doorways, and drank vodka while I was working. Once I'd asked a patient who was so eager to get discharged and back to her stoop, what was the attraction of her life? From what she told me, I thought it was freedom from work, duties, responsibilities. But in the rain that day, I wondered if homeless, cold, and sheltered only by her stoop, she meant the feeling I had that day. I was happy, and I knew I was happy, the happiest I'd ever been. Not blissful, joyous angels coming out of the clouds, but happy as in a feeling of great pleasure or contentment arising from satisfaction with one's circumstances. Happy from hap, as in what happens, things as they turn out to be. And when I get back home that year, I put away my things, my stick, my pilgrim's passport and shell, my pilgrim clothes. I wouldn't take them out again for a year, and yet I didn't stop feeling like a pilgrim. Now and then, as I was walking down the wide corridor between wards, the click of my footsteps would remind me, and I would be pilgriming across that muddy field, happy with things just as they were. Perhaps for that reason, my relationships with my patients began to deepen. When you think about it, doctoring has everything to do with not accepting things as they are. And while I did not stop doctoring my patients, there was some new way in which I was appreciating them just for who they were. Now, this was a particularly good thing at this point because Laguna Honda had been discovered over the hill to the poorhouse by the lawyers from the Department of Justice, not just the health efficiency uh, uh, people, but lawyers from the Department of Justice, lawyers from uh, the Healthcare Financing Administration, and the disability lawyers. And nobody much liked what they saw. They didn't like the chapel, they didn't like the aviary, <clears throat> they didn't like the beauty salon, but they particularly did not like the open wards. Because it turns out that we have a civil right to privacy, according to the Department of Justice, which I wish I'd known when I was uh, in those dorms in college. <laughs> <clears throat> And so they insisted that, that San Francisco either rebuild a new, modern healthcare facility in San Francisco or just shut the place down. So there were a lot of battles. It went on for years. There were a lot of battles between the opposing sides. And finally, there was a bond which nobody thought was going to pass, which ended up passing two to one. And uh, they started, uh, they got the architects and they started building. And it, mostly, I really kind of ignored the whole thing for as long as I could, but one day I was driving in and I saw that these you know, beautiful modern uh, buildings were starting to come to arise and I realized that it really was going to happen, that this old fashioned place where I had enough time was going to be torn down and go away and that if it did, after it did, nobody would believe what, it, what had happened there. So I decided I was going to take a sabbatical and try and see if I could capture the place in a book. Uh, and so that's what I did. I took a sabbatical. And I also, as I was writing this book, God's Hotel, I also used the time to start learning about our healthcare system and thinking about what I'd seen in my career as a doc and how I would sort of think about what had been happening in the last 25 years uh, of myself as a doctor. And what I decided that it was a kind of pendulum, that the pendulum of medical care, health care, had really uh, moved from the personal to the efficient. That's, that was the fundamental thing. That I was more and more impressed, though, by how inefficient that efficiency was. Because as you heard from what Dr. Pierce was telling you, healthcare economists have been working for decades now to try and do something with healthcare costs and do something about efficiency, and yet every year we spend more and more money no matter what they've done. So this is just an example graph. <coughs> Nobody can really figure out why, but no one's happy with what's going on. And so what I did one day is just start thinking, well, what do I know? Which is I do know what happened at Laguna Honda. So I'm going to show you now, I'm going to end the talk by showing you what happened at Laguna Honda in the 20 years I was there. So in the 20 years I was there, as a cost-cutting measure, 
the number of patients that we took care of went down. It was cut from 1,178 when I first got there to 780 patients. Correspondingly, the number of uh, doctors was cut from 32 to 9. And the number of clinical staff was cut from 1,500 to 1,200. And yet, the budget rose every year. What was the reason for that? Well, when I looked into it, what I discovered was that even though the patients were cut and the doctors were cut and the clinical staff was cut, the overall staff stayed about the same because there were more and more administrators every year. <laughs> and what did all those administrators do? Well, the one thing there was more of when I left Laguna Honda than when I started Laguna Honda were forms. So when I first got to Laguna Honda, there were two forms in the chart. There were these two single page forms. The day before I left, I took out, we had, still had paper charts, I took out the old paper charts and I just took a random chart out and I counted. There were 43 forms in that particular chart and none of them was single page forms. They were all three page forms, five page forms, 20 page forms. There were so many forms that the charts would like explode from the forms and medical records had to come and thin out all the doctor's notes to make room for the forms. So I made, um, <clears throat> Uh, in fact, actually, by the time I left, I was horrified to realize there were actually more full-time quality assurance managers than there were doctors. There were 12. Um, so I actually put together, uh, the day I left, a few days later, I put together this, sorry, I've never corrected this, but uh, this is the chart I put together for myself. And I'll just go over it with you. So here are the patients we saw going all the way down. And there are the doctors, a black line. And there's um, the administrators staying about the same. And there's the budget, and here's the forms. And I predict here, as you can see, that if the present trends continue, by 2024, the number of patients we take care of at Laguna Honda will hit zero. <laughs> there will still be two doctors. There'll still be 1,500 staff. There'll be a budget of $275 million and an infinite number of forms. <laughs> What's really terrifying, I'm not kidding guys, I looked at the current data, it fits this form. I mean, it fits this graph, it's, it fits it. It's like really interesting. Uh, and I call this to myself doing less with more. And the thing is, is I don't think we can blame the administrators. You know, they're just responding to all the rules and regulations that are raining down on them. But I do think we as a country can recognize that it's not what we meant to happen at all. Right? At Laguna Honda, anyway, what happened was that in the interests of efficiency, we became more inefficient. In the interest of putting the patient first, we ended up having to put the real patient last. And in the interest of moving from an, institu from, from an institution to a community, we ended up with way more of an institution than a community. And so the question that I think Dr. Uh, Pierce was talking about and we're talking about today is what can we now do about this? And I've asked myself this question, if I could do anything, I was just given carte blanche, I could do one thing, what would it be to make things work? And it would be to put inefficiency back into healthcare. And I mean something very specific by inefficiency. I mean that free amorphous time that is the essence of what we need if we're gonna be personal. That's what's been taken out and that's what I would put back. And the ironic part and the wonderful part and what I think is gonna change, make the change possible is the fact is, is that when you give doctors and nurses and therapists and patients enough time to do a good job, it's actually cost effective. It's efficient and that in the end is what I think may uh, save us. So I think I will end there. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you, Dr. Sweet, for that fabulous talk. So uh, we'll have time for some questions. If people have questions, we have some uh, microphones. If you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. We'll bring you a microphone so that everybody can hear your question. So we have some down here and one in the back. So I'm going to bring the microphones down. Is this on? It's, it's on. Um, uh, thanks. Thanks for the really, really interesting talk. Uh, I was wondering if, uh, if maybe one of your books or or some other sources where I could find where uh, your thesis about uh, chronic diseases mm -hmm. and its relation to slow medicine uh -huh. being possibly more effective than fast medicine. Uh, uh, where I could find where that's possibly been quantified, or has it been? Has there have there been any uh, fast medicine type of studies? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes. Okay. On that? So everybody heard that. I take it. Yes. So the question is: is you know, are there studies sort of with my hypothesis that uh, fast medicine, you know, that that chronic diseases respond better to slow medicine. Of course, we have to sort of define our terms, as I've used them in this sort of fast medicine, slow medicine, fast food, slow food ways. It's, I, I would love to do a study. And when I was at Laguna Honda, I had this idea of really taking the bull by, by the horns and setting up a project. It's one of the things I call the eco-medicine project, where I would do precisely that. I would sort of say, get out of my way. Let's just have a comparison study of a group of patients where you just gave doctors uh, enough time to do a good job, which is really kind of the essence of the matter, you know? That's really what I mean by slow medicine, is getting our time back, and actually compare what those patients cost to another group of patients. Um, but actually, there is a kind of experiment, a very interesting experiment, an unwitting experiment that's going on right now, and it's with this whole new thing called concierge medicine. Uh, you guys know what's meant by this concierge medicine model? It's sometimes called direct patient model. I get the feeling not from this group. Is that right? You do know. OK. And it's providing exactly what we're talking about in the sense of the question is, what happens? Is it cheaper to give doctors back? And I, when I say doctors, I want to say I mean also nurses and therapists and the whole group of, health, of caretaking people. But I'm going to say doctors now. But I, it really is everybody. Um, because concierge medicine actually is doing that. There's doctors are saying, I can't practice, I can't have 2,500 patients and do a good job. There's no way if I have three minutes with the patient that I can do a good job. That's why I order all the MRI scans, right? It's because if you come to me with your back pain and I have 10 minutes and my electronic health records take seven minutes and I have three minutes with you, I can't examine you. All I can do is order an MRI scan. So the concierge model are docs who said, we can't have a panel of 2,500. I can comfortably manage 300 patients. It's going to cost $1,800 a year if I do that, yada, yada, yada. And they've been doing this for the last several years, and they're actually coming out with some data there. So it's not quite what you're talking about of, chron of, of chronic diseases, but it's looking at this concept of if you give doctors back their time, they have enough time, is it cheaper or more expensive? And the studies are starting to show, not surprisingly, that it is cheaper. What do I mean by cheaper? There was a study that just came out um, that showed that there were 15% fewer hospitalizations of the patients under the care of a concierge doctor than the average patient. Now, it's very hard to do this, right? Because by definition right now, concierge people probably have more money. If they have more money, they're healthier, they're thinner, they don't smoke. There, there's that whole confusing piece but certainly not more expensive, we could say that. The number of medications people take go down, which saves a tremendous amount of money. So there is a few studies coming out like that, and I think that should be studied. And one of the things I'd love to see, because whenever you bring up the word concierge medicine, and whenever I've done it, I get a big pushback from the audience because it's so expensive and it's for rich people, and that those are very fair statements. I think we need to have a, I'd love to have an experiment where we had concierge practice for the sick poor. Let's take the people who are the sickest, let's give them a doctor who only has a certain group of them, and see how much that costs. I know from my experience, I mean, I know, pretty sure from my experience at Laguna Honda that we will save money. And I'll give you one just piece of data that I have personally, 
which is the average patient I would get at within 100, which were the complicated, sick poor, with a bunch of chronic diseases, as well as acute things that had just gone on. They would come into Laguna Honda anywhere between 15 and 26 medications on average. And because I had enough time to see them and fuss with their medicines, after about a few months, I could get them down to about five medicines. And the difference between being on 20 medications and five medications, just the medications alone, is hundreds of dollars. It's hundreds of dollars almost a day. And if you put in the adverse reactions and the problems and the complications you have with medicines you don't need, just that alone is cost effective. So there's sort of experiments going on. There's, I'd love to see a concierge practice for the sick poor. And just looking at medications is one way to save money. So that isn't quite what you're talking about, but I think it kind of is, is sort of a little bit the essence of it, is that people are just getting too much done to them. And if we do a lot less, we're going to save money. People are going to be better, no matter what they have. Hmm? Uh, can I just call in people? Are, are you supposed to call in people? No, you just take the microphone and we can just, would you give them a microphone and we'll, we'll ask questions. So if you... uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. Oh, and my thanks. question is, what did you think the Health Care Act is going to do to the inefficiency uh, of efficiency? So everybody heard that. What, what do I think of the Health Care Act is, well, it's not going to make it more efficient, that's for sure, if we mean by efficient and saving any money. I actually read the Health Care Act. Um, <laughs> it's kind of scary because I have said that to thousands of people now, and only one person has raised their hand and said, well, I read half of it. <laughs> really, that, it's, it, it's kind of unnerving. And maybe we have some economists here, maybe they read it. But I did. I sat down a couple of years ago and said, you know, I keep reading the newspaper, oh, we're such bad people because, you know, I don't know if you noticed that. When the paper would be like, Americans don't know what's happening with the Health Care Act. That's really bad. They should know, citizens. And, and, yet, and yet, in the newspaper itself, they'd never tell you what was, they tell you three things, right? They tell you about the mandate, or they tell you about the pre existing conditions. You know, if they were on the right, they tell you about the bad things, one bad thing. And if they were on the left, they tell you about one good thing. But I'm going, like, it's 922 single space pages. There's got to be more in it than those two things. So I ordered it up, and they sent it, and it's 922 single space pages. And I said, well, it's not any bigger than Harrison's internal medicine. So I did what I did with Harrison, so I read 10 pages a day for three months. It was really interesting. I recommend people at least look at it. It was scary. And it was not scary so much because there was one thing that was terrible. It was that I got the feeling that all these sections had been written by different people, that nobody had sort of put them all together and realized. I mean, I started, as I was reading it, I started counting how many different divisions, departments, councils, those kind of things. There were like, I mean, I got bored about a third of the way doing There was at least 25 or 30, just those things alone. And, and the things, they didn't fit together, you know, section, uh, uh, was going to contrast with section, huh, nah. and it was just like, and as a doc, it was so scary, because I'm just going like, I'll give you one little example of, of just one little thing that struck me. So I was looking at on, on long-term care, because that's something I know uh, pretty well. And so one of the, and it was totally understandable, one of the little, little sentences was that because of the terrible problem of elder abuse, certainly elder abuse in nursing homes or institutions, it's terrible, but the answer, the solution to that problem was going to be that anybody who worked in a nursing home uh, or a long-term care facility would have a background check. Okay, or a background check and fingerprints. So that looked okay until you started thinking about it. You read a little further and it said, including the consultants. And then I started thinking at Laguna Honda about all the people who came in there. I mean, really? All those, what about, you know, what about the cousins? What about, the relatives, what about the visitors? What about the, all of those people that are going to get background checks? They will get background checks if it's in the law or not, right? So that was like one little piece, just the repercussions, the, the, the just huge problems, that one thing. And there were, I want to say thousands without exaggerating, but I'll say hundreds of things that were very disturbing. So I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know. I talked with some of my lawyer friends, and apparently that happens with laws. and. You can change them afterwards, and that is what we're seeing. We're seeing when they finally take up the section on such and such, they realize that there's a contradiction in it, and then they're going back and changing it. But I don't think there's any way it can make it more efficient. It, it's not possible. Other questions? Dr. Sweet? 
is is uh, is there a place for technology in buying more time for the patient with the doctor? In other words, with better information that comes to you through some of the things that we'll hear about maybe later on in the symposium uh, to give you the time, give the doctor the time to become, and the whole process to become more efficient. Can you repeat the question? I will be happy to repeat it. So the question is, is there a place for technology to give, to, to be something that gave doctors back their time with patients? I will answer that um, in, in, in two, two different aspects. Theoretically, and, and what happens in practice. So theoretically, there's just fabulous ideas out there. I mean, you don't even, even need doctors. Oh my god, there's some great books out there, like The End of Medicine, The End of Doctoring. It's marvelous. And believe me, as a patient, if we can get technology that I never have to go to the doctor again or have my blood checked, I will be thrilled. So I mean, the, the theoretical possibility that um, docs have talked about, really, um, has been some marvelous future we might even have like this computer at home, like you could just imagine an apps and all these things, where you maybe stick your finger in a computer, right? And it can just analyze the whole thing. It'll have AI, you want to be a blood test, it'll spit out, you know, electronically send your prescriptions to some place and they'll deliver to your door. And there's little robot chips inside them, they can monitor when you need new medicines. All this stuff's happening. And in theory, it's wonderful and I look forward to the day where I don't have to have any tests or anything like that. My experience of how technology plays out in practice is very different. And the example I'll give you is electronic medical records. So electronic medical records were sold to us on the idea, the theory, that they would save tons of time. And it's true that, you know, it's a big mess. You all know, like if you go to one hospital, you get an MRI, and then your doctor never finds out about it. And, then because of HIPAA, oh my God, then you've got to go to get signed things and it's just a mess, right? You end up with... So the idea behind electronic medical records and the theory is wonderful and, and I can just tell you that the problem is not the idea of electronic medical records, it's the implementation. And I personally have an idea for making them all wonderful and cheap and I'll tell you that in a second because anybody wants to steal this idea, I give it to you because I would like this to happen. But what's actually happened with electronic medical records in practice is they were mandated in 2009 with that high tech act by our government that everybody had to have them instantly by, or they start getting fined this year, doctors. But the technology really didn't exist to do really good electronic medical records. And they're very costly. They cost about $80,000 per doctor's office to get these mandated medic electronic medical records. You all know what I'm talking about, yeah? Electronic medical records, right. So it's mandated, doctors have to do it. The technology is, Terrible. Not that it doesn't exist, but it, the way they've actually come out, they they implemented it by putting it on the on the billing over on top of the billing computing electronic medical record system, and which goes back to the 70s. So it is ridiculous. It doesn't do the few things you wanted electronic medical record. It's not what's called interoperable. There's last time I checked, there were a thousand different systems, and they're deliberately made so they're not interoperable because everybody wants you to buy their own system, right? So that, what does interoperable mean? It means that if your doctor has one system, he can't, he can, he still can't talk to the hospital. He can't get your MRI scan. It's like a mess. There's a thousand different uh, electronic medical records, systems at least, they cost $80,000 per person. And does it save time? Well, they've just, just come out with, finally they had some studies because the theory was that it would save time. It should save time, but it didn't save time. Doctors are spending 70% of their time filling out forms on the electronic medical records. So that's what happened in practice. Now, there's no reason, it, I don't understand why it's so complicated. So, so, and I've actually talked with some computer people, it's really pretty interesting about how this worked out. I don't understand why we can't just have like an iBook medical record, not an iBook, an eBook medical record for each patient that would be in the cloud. You, you, we already have it, it's just like iTunes, only be I, iTunes for medicine, right? So you come into your office, the doc takes your, med, practice, takes your chart that you have now, your paper chart. He doesn't have to have data entry people, just scans it in. That creates your ebook that's accessible to everybody. And then he can write on his tablet and go right in there and anybody can look at it and all the stuff can feed in through your iBook and it's your own personal 
ebook that's got your name on it, Victoria Sweet, that's your ebook, and a doctor in Madagascar, if I'm visiting, can actually go on the cloud and look at it and write stuff, and then when I go back home, the doctor can see what he did, and I don't understand why they're not doing it, because it would be cheap, it would be interoperable, everybody I have access to it, I don't get it. Well, anybody who wants to contact me and work on it with me, I'd be happy to do it, because really, honestly, somebody sent me a YouTube the other day of a, personally, the kind of doc that I want, who's a white-haired doc, who's been around for a, even longer than me, okay? That's the kind of doc I want to have. And this doc had taken a sledgehammer to his electronic medical record system. <laughs> he did. You can see it on YouTube. He's smashing it to bits. He'd given up, and he was quitting. And this is terrible. The man's 70 years old. He's got 10, 10 years, at least, of being a fantastic doctor. The kind of doctor you walk in there, and he goes, get out of here. You got nothing. It's kind of, that's, that's sufficient. So, and he just gave up, he can't stand it. No. So we have another question or two in the back here on uh, this side of the auditorium. I'm pretty loud, you may be able to do this without a microphone. Ah. Dr. Sweet, I'm a family doctor by training, and I'm embarrassed to tell you that I've also done some administration. <laughs> now, come on, I, I said not to blame the administrators, really. Yeah. From all of the doctors in all of the realms of medicine that I've been involved in. But there is also a need for access. And when you talk about the inefficiency of medicine being efficient, we incentivize volume. We don't incentivize value in medicine mm -hmm. these days. What would the incentives look like under your system? How would you make that change? How would you move to a system in which we could spend more time with mm -hmm. patients, we could be inefficient, and still provide the access that I think we all want? Okay, so did people hear that? Yeah. Yes. Um, you have a loud voice, you do. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, well, I can imagine I've been thinking a lot about this, and I think there's three or four different ways to answer this. First of all, just in general, if my hypothesis, and even my hypothesis, if, we're, if doctors are spending 70% of their time on forms, then we basically can get 70% of docs. It's like having, would it be like having 70% more physicians if we didn't have that system? Just forgetting, rearranging it and incentivizing and all that kind of stuff. It's a mess, and, and we're losing docs. I mean, I think I read, I calculated, asked myself, how many docs are retiring? I mean, my friends are retiring and they should not be, they can't stand the system. We are losing the equivalent, I figured out, of like four medical schools worth of docs every year that are just people young. I mean, relatively, docs in their 50s and 60s, you don't want us retiring. Really, you don't. So we're losing, the, so that is part of our access. So that's one thing. And I keep, and so I thought, but you know, nobody believes it. So I thought one thing about, is about having like a slow medicine day where we would we just like, we don't know, so let's have our experiment be, we'll, we'll pick a day next year, and everybody will just decide to practice slow medicine, i.e. take as much time as they need with patients that one particular day. They won't fill out any forms. No forms at all. They won't go on the computer unless they have to go on the computer to get something they need out of them. They're not gonna fill out any forms. They won't fill out this one day, and we'll see at the end of the day, are you, if you, see, if you take as much time as you need with patients, do you really end up at midnight? Or does it turn out if you've got 70% of your time back, you actually can see your patients and do a good job and order fewer things? So we needed an experiment in some ways to, to show that, because I think that's kind of what you're talking about. I don't think you're talking about something else which I thought a lot about is actual the economics of doing that, because there are ways of doing it. I mean, the short answer would be, I, I've thought of three different ways of, of doing it. It's like if we're just talking about the poor, like how do people, or people who maybe, not some fair, people without insurance, what would we do? I mean, the system we had in San Francisco, and this old system, there's something to be said for having a safety net of the safety nets, right? I love the idea of having a free county hospital. So for a while I thought, you know what? Why don't we open a free county hospital and that free county clinic system and just open them up and have them be free? And they won't be fair, and they won't be as beautiful as what the rich people have, but have it be free. And let and you pay the and that way you pay the docs on salaries, like I've always been paid on a salary, which is fine. And people just walk in, and that would be our sort of default. You would know that even if you lost your insurance, you could always go to the 
to the clinics and you wouldn't be charged anything. So that would be one way to have like a safety net of the safety nets and just see how many people used it. So th those are a couple of ideas. I mean, I personally think that when I'm paid as a salary, I've always really liked that. On the other hand, I know docs are paid as a salary, then that, that, sorry to say, the administrators load them up with more patients than they could see. I mean, 2,500 patients in a panel for one physician? Well, what kind of job can I do if I have that? So that's kind of the problem with the salary system, and I agree with you, the for-profit system is horrible. I, I can go on for a long time. And we have we time have for maybe one, one more question. Somebody else have another question they want to ask? Okay, well, thank you for uh, that one. one. Oh, one more question, more, okay. I think so they're pointing at somebody. Back here? Yeah. Ah. Oh, sorry. We'll split the question. <laughs> okay, you can ask the first part of the question and you can ask the second. <laughs> Uh, there's like a shadow pattern that you're describing. It's like um, complexity, cost, and then reducing the, so you have an understanding for the patient. And so 15 medicines cost complexity and then the understanding. So if you can eliminate the medicines, the patient gets wiser. We start focusing on one pattern that the patient focuses on. And the mother always has an understanding for the infant. So the medicines create a lot of complexity, is that what you're pointing out? And as you eliminate the medicines, the mother yeah. starts to focus better on the understanding of what it's she's looking the, for. No question that if you can, the more medicines I can get rid of, the happier I always am, for sure. Was there one more question here too, or comment? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much for coming out here. Uh -huh. I really appreciate the time. Now, my question is, as the um, medical industry becomes more and more at the behest of clumsy and unworkable legislation. I mean, you can see this in the ACA and, and the other things you highlighted. What representation do physicians have uh, in pushing back against those things? And as a corollary, how is medicine going to rebound when these systems do finally just fall apart under their own weight? Well, very deep questions. Like, really, those, those are really a, a Real concern, I think. And that's one of the reasons this is so exciting for me, this symposium, because we have some real economists here who actually went to medical school. I'm like all thrilled. Um, and probably this is a place to really talk about that, because I don't have an answer to that, which is, you know, we talk about physicians. I figured out that primary care physicians, so internal medicine docs, family practice doc, peds, the people who actually see patients, are three. Our entire amount we're paid is three cents of every dollar we spend in healthcare. So, 90, so, so that's just not money, but it's also power, it's also position, right? Three cents, and all of the docs gets paid between 10 cent, 10% and 15%. So 85% of our money is not going to doctors and surgeons and actually it's going to this whole other huge system. And that's why I've thought about a slow medicine day almost like as a strike as docs and patients and nurses just saying, you know what? We are the healthcare system. We don't need you. You need us. And we're going to show you. Because today, we're just going to do it our way and see how you like it. Um, because otherwise, what I've seen as I've gone around the country talking is there's lots of doctors and then nurses. I didn't realize until I started doing this. The nurses have been as, as trashed as doctors have by this huge thing that's building. I mean, I get as many emails from nurses about the book like, yeah, you know, we've lost this, and therapists, and everybody. So I don't know have the answer to that. I mean, I think something like Slow Medicine Day, some kind of strike. <laughs> I mean, hmm? Um, and the other thing that's going on is because of the concierge medicine, what's happening in California anyway is that it started out for rich people, but it's been tumbling down and doctors are realizing, I know docs in California who take $50 a month and take care of, and their panel's 600 patients, right? They can make a living on that. And $50 a month, if you actually look, if that $50 a month is enough for a doc, then would it, and they're not taking, they're not involved in the system at all. They, you pay them $50 a month, that's it, they don't bill. That's it. So there may be, I think there's kind of a, an alternative pay mechanism that's a whole way that's, well, nobody's looking is kind of coming up here. 
and it's going fast. So we may find that we've got this big mess here, but something in our wonderful capitalist system has actually grown that's clean and simple. Okay? Yeah. Thank you very much.